Hello, good morning, everyone. Ah, I see that we have our, our keynote speaker here, Dr. Wen. Good morning to you. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for joining us here this morning uh, for our data science and racial health disparities research symposium. I'm Maureen Sarter, professor of computational medicine and bioinformatics at the University of Michigan and uh, organizer and host for this event, uh, which is funded by the University of Michigan Rackham Graduate School through a Rackham Faculty Allies and Student Ally Grant and by the Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics. Um, in addition to acknowledging our funding sources, I wanted to thank my colleagues in bioinformatics, especially Dr. Ala Karnofsky um, and our student ally, Kevin Huang, for helping to organize this symposium. And I also wanna thank our staff members, Jane Weisner and Aaron Bookvich for all of their work helping to organize this symposium. So I thought I'd start um, the introduction with a definition of racial health disparities, which um, I found from the Center of Medicare Advocacy. Um, I'm definitely not an expert on this. And so I may not have chosen the best definition, but what they say is this, the term health disparities is often defined as a difference in which disadvantaged social groups, such as the poor racial ethnic minorities, women and other groups who have persistently experienced social disadvantage or discrimination systematically experience worse health or greater health risks than more advantaged social groups. When this term is applied to certain ethnic and race, racial social groups, it describes the increased presence and severity of certain diseases poor health outcomes and greater difficulty in obtaining healthcare services for these races and ethnicities. So socially disadvantaged groups uh, really suffer from a host of challenges that have detrimental effects on their health, including being less likely to have health insurance coverage, living in more highly polluted areas, having less access to healthy food choices, language barriers, and high rates of chronic stress. The overall results uh, are numerous and include higher levels of obesity and di diabetes, higher mortality rates for several other diseases, and often higher infant mortality rates, depending on the specific group. In terms of equity and inclusivity, many of these same groups tend to be underrepresented in human subjects research, including clinical trials and in population genetic studies. Their poor representation in these research studies translates to a poor understanding of risk, ideology, and progression of diseases. Um, furthermore, machine learning approaches trained mainly with one racial or ethnic group can end up being less effective or even worse biased in, the way that, in a way that perpetuates stereotypes and disparities. So my colleagues and I here at Michigan proposed this symposium, symposium because we know how important racial health, racial health disparities research is and our global goal of health equity. And we wanted to help educate our community that is biomedical informaticists, bioinformaticians and other data scientists, both on the ways that data science and other computational approaches are being used to study and address racial health disparities. Um, but also conversely, how using data science and computational methods on biased data sets can have a negative impact and actually exacerbate health disparities. So obviously rigorous data science is crucial to future health disparities research. And I hope that this symposium and other similar ones will help serve to initiate our new collaborations among data scientists, epidemiologists, clinicians, and others doing research to make health more equitable for all of us. Um, in, um, in addition to the symposium talks, I wanted to mention briefly our, um, our DEI data challenge event, which we planned in conjunction with the symposium and was led by my colleague, Dr. Christina Matreya, who's on here. We had two different challenges for students to choose from, and Dr. Matreya will be announcing them and the winners just before lunch today. So uh, now to introduce our keynote speaker, we're thrilled and so honored to have Dr. Robert Wynn as our keynote speaker. Dr. Wynn is the director of the Virginia Commonwealth University or VCU Massey Cancer Center, uh, which was one of the original cancer centers designated by the NCI back in 1974. Last year, he was named president elect of the Association of American Cancer Institutes or AACI. Uh, Dr. Wynn received his MD actually here at the University of Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor in 1993. He did his residency at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago, 
followed by a fellowship in pulmonary medicine and critical care at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. He's received numerous high profile awards over the years, uh, too numerous to mention, but I'll just mention the, the most recent two were the AACI Cancer Health Equity Award in 2021 and the Medical Society of Virginia's 2021 Salute to Service Award for service to the uninsured and underserved. He's now leading the nation in establishing a 21st century model of equity for cancer science and care. Um, obviously, he is very committed to community engaged research centered on eliminating health inequities. Um, he's also a principal investigator on several community based projects funded by the NIH and NCI, including the All of Us Research Program, which is a precision medicine effort planned to run from 2018 to 2028 to study data from 1 million people living in the United States and with the ultimate goal to achieve individualized healthcare. Um, Dr. Winnis received uh, national and international acclaim for his efforts to empower underserved patient populations, improve health care delivery, and ensure equal access to cancer care. And with that, I want to thank you, Dr. Wynn, um, not only for presenting for us here today, but for all of your efforts and work in this area. So let, let's give Dr. Wynn a warm welcome and thank you very much from all of us. Thank you all. And uh, I think the saying is, go blue. Um, so <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I'm gonna start off by sort of saying that this may be a little bit of a different type of talk uh, than you're used to. There certainly will be data, um, but my biggest point is to get this conversation beyond uh, just the data and what the data actually means and that connectedness to our community. I really believe that we are in a point and a place right now where we have to consider the concept of place and space and the impact it has on science. These are uh, my uh, conflicts of interest. Um, I'll start off <clears throat> by saying, uh, and, 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 and usually uh, really trying to frame this slide. And it's a, a, a quote that's attributed to Mark Twain. And it says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And interestingly enough, I think when we think about a lot of academic medicine and even public health, there have been a lot of good things that we have done. Certainly, there have been some things that we've absolutely held on to that we uh, think we know for sure that turns out to not be so, that occasionally has some negative impact. The talk today will be centered around um, just so that we're all framed in the context of social justice. And let me explain social justice to you in a little bit the way at least I see it. Many people now talk about health equity and I get it, but health equity is defined is a principle of underlying commitment to reducing and ultimately eliminating disparities in health and its determinants. When we think about health differences, we're thinking about the differences in outcomes between two groups. But when I think of health disparities, this is by Braven, but also by this is using the Warnicke model. And the best way to sort of say it is um, after, uh, prostate cancer. We know that there are data that are out there right now that says that African-American men and Caucasian, when given the same access to care, let's say in the VA system, tend to have similar outcomes. But we all know that there is a health outcome difference between African-American men and Caucasians when we look at this more globally. And that's related to the fact that one group has access and the other cannot to. I will not be talking about health equity. I will be talking about health equity as a pursuit, as an aspiration, but we are deep and our numbers are um, actually um, validating that deep into continued disparities. So, science, and how do I see all this being put together? 
Well, I think we're in an interesting time. Um, I'm going to go back, way back in time uh, a little bit, um, and, uh, and talk really about what I consider to be our progression of science and sciences. In the latter part of the 19th century, and um, uh, to a large extent, to the greater part of the uh, 20th century, at least to the mid 20th century, our focus had been on matter and energy. In fact, land grant institutions, many like Michigan State, University of Illinois, many others, were really focused in those early days really on figuring out the engineering principles and going around from there to figuring out the physics of how do we split atoms to et cetera, et cetera. Uh, many of you know that the work that has been done, um, particularly in the Midwest at the University of Chicago and other things in the context of matter and energy. The next phase of science though, and I put this picture up specifically for Crick, Watson and Franklin in the famous photo 51. We subsequently in 1950 changed radically from just the focus on matter and energy to now being able to understand and uh, be able to detect the human cell and the nature of that cell. That changed science forever. In fact, as a result of that, we had the impact on that was that we produced people like David Baltimore, uh, Philip Sharp, and James Allison, right? Philip Sharp is important for cre uh, creation of the split gene that we now know uh, and the whole thing about splicing David Baltimore for the reverse transcriptase, which to this day really are, have been key factors in us being able to move forward in our thinking around the nature of the human cell and how to get a better understanding of it. That science led the foundation for great movements, such as the 1971 War on Cancer Act that led to the uh, National Cancer Act uh, and established the first three designated cancer centers in the United States, those being Memorial Sloan, uh, uh, MD Anderson, and Roswell Park. That program has now grown to 71 designated cancer centers, of which um, your cancer center led by uh, Dr. Eric Fioran, if you're on, and myself here at VCU Massey have benefited from. The answer is it, science, right? The bedrock is science. In 1971, they made a statement that we would eradicate cancer by 1981. By understanding literally just the science and understanding the nature of the human cell, we'd be able to literally eradicate science, I mean, eradicate cancer. I submit to you that in 2022, we know that that was a little bit ambitious, but we've also known that while certainly we can make some progress with the science, and while it is necessary to make some gains in reducing cancer disparities, it is not sufficient to eradicate cancer. The AACR Health Disparities Report, which I was a part of in 2020, did give us a glimmer of hope. That when we looked specifically at black-white differences from the 1990s to then 2016, and even if you look at the trends now, that we had certainly made some strides. But while we made some strides, it's important to point out that there were still disparities. When you look at African-American men in prostate cancer versus their Caucasian colleagues, or whether you look at uh, African-American women with breast cancer, and by the way, breast cancer for African-American African -American women now has become the number one killer, uh, um, uh, overshadowing now lung cancer. We have to think about what's going on. Now, before you start thinking that this health disparities issue is hashtag just something around race, let me stop you in your tracks and just tell you that disparities are, again, anytime you have differences in outcomes. And when you start looking, again, at the social justice part about the access, quality, and care, when that is unequal, you have a disparity. Let me give you an example of why geography matters. A 70-year-old white male living in Utah versus a 70-year-old male living in Kentucky don't always have the same outcomes either. That 70-year-old male 
in Kentucky has one, almost three and a half times, almost four times the, the, the risk of getting cancer and having a poor outcome. And by the way, little known fact, but that we know that women, bisexual women are 70% more likely to be diagnosed with cancer than compared to heterosexual women. So let's stop thinking about disparities in the terms, in the context of this traditional thing. We say rural, you think white, you think disparities, you always think that this is about African-Americans or whatever. Point number one. Point number two. I love science, and I believe that what we do from the public health sort of perspective and what we're doing with big data, and this is why the big data thing will matter, because I actually do think that we're moving towards now a third sort of movement in the context of our awareness of the power of data. We started with the power of matter and energy. We moved to the power of understanding the human cell, the nature of the human cell, and now I think data will be important. I say that with a pause. Because sometimes in our excitement of the science, remember, Crick, Watson, and Franklin came up with photo 51, and we understand DNA, um, and we kept then, we, I mean, that science really then unleashed uh, a whole host of things. But by 1951, we had a woman named Henrietta Lacks. Now, when Henrietta Lacks in 1951 checked into the hospital, she didn't know she had cervical cancer, but she did, and she passed away. That's not the story. The story is Dr. Gay, George Gay from Johns Hopkins. We know this Henrietta Lacks and the immortal cells of Henrietta Lacks and all the rest of that, but it's not so much that George Gay from Johns Hopkins at the time um, successfully uh, was able to um, actually take Henrietta Lacks' cells and have them immortalized and we got the HeLa cell, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the blind spots within our science, the, the blind spots of humanity within our science. When we unleash, right, probably one of the biggest findings in science that transformed the way we did science, we also, at our worst, in thinking of the humanity around that science and the impact on communities. Now, let's not get it twisted. Dr. Gay didn't just take Henrietta cells and that was the first one. You probably know that there were at least 30, 40 attempts before you had Henrietta Lacks in creating um, this immortalized cell. What's the big deal, you might say? Well, the big deal is, as many of you know, Jonas Sark, Many of the big pharma companies uh, and those people who were clever enough to figure out what to do with these cells certainly did a lot. And in fact, it's not that I am discounting that science, but hear me out for a second. Those families, the descendants of those people who created those cells and learned how to do big pharma things with those cells benefited by having resources brought to their table as a result of their you know, of uh, their mom or their dad or whomever else who owned those companies finding these things with these cells, right? The descendants of the descendants of the descendants benefited financially. And yet, Henry Delax and her family, which are on the verge almost of uh, essentially just struggling for every little cent and just trying to make a living, benefited not at all. Now listen, I'm not trying to say we shouldn't do science, but there should be an awareness that every time we come up with, quote, scientific progress, we inadvertently increase disparities. Now, some may argue, what are you talking about? But I would dare and even put every cent that I have in my pocket right now on the table and show me when there was a, a movement for scientific progress that it didn't inadvertently create a disparity whether you're talking about with the advent of the mammography or colorectal screening. I say this because we are on the verge now of data, big data, and the intersectionality of what that data will have on impact on our communities. And I say to you that whenever there is numerical drugs, whenever there's numerical uh, 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 
uh, uh, technology, whenever there's a numerical concept, let's try to do something different than introduce an inverted disparity and be much more conscious about the equitability. Why does this matter? Because precision medicine, immunotherapy, data, all of these things are our tools just like what they were doing in the 1950s or the 1960s with new technologies like mammographies and all the rest of these other things in the 70s, et cetera, et cetera. We are at a, 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 at a moment right now that our new discoveries may also inadvertently, if we're not careful, introduce disparities. This is just an example of breast cancer mortality. I'm just giving you this some seer data, just to look at the widening gap um, uh, between African-American women and uh, Caucasian women in the context of breast cancer deaths. And I submit to you that in large part, you can go back to the initial um, uh, discovery of the mammography and start seeing where the lines start to separate. When it comes to screening, this is the National Cancer Screen Trotting, doesn't, when it comes to the actual therapy, you know, we, we, we act as if, you know, uh, you know that uh, the immunotherapy and all these things were, again, has uh, driven sharp declines in cancer mortality overall, but Dr. Brawley and others actually have also noted that there was also an introduction of an immunotherapy divide. We talk about artificial intelligence, again, as a major tool, as data, as being this next, just like we talk about matter and energy, just like we talk about the science of the uh, understanding now the nature of the human cell. We talk about these things in similar terms when we're talking about our new technologies and data, but the but is, they may be great tools, but if they're not equitably distributed, we still, often expand our disparities. Here's an example. This is an example from uh, one, of my, uh, um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Chosis, who uh, took a picture of one of the hospitals on the south side of Chicago. And in the face of talking about artificial intelligence and all these other things, that's clearly just down the road. It's on the south side of Chicago. You have a hospital with an active manhole. And everyone's covering up their nose because of the smell in there. But by the way, they're not rigid. We aren't reading anything from an artificial intelligence tool. These docs are just trying to make it with an analog. We need to stop playing. More than 62% of oncologists, say you've got a group of 10,000 oncologists and you're just asking them general questions, not about how they take care of people, but in general, how does the field take care? I just want you to pay attention to that 62% of oncologists, this is uh, it's a poll taken by the NCCN and ACS CAN, 62% of oncologists says that when it comes to health outcomes, they believe that their patients of color did worse than their white patients. I understand that COVID did a lot and everyone's COVID fatigue, but let me just reaffirm for you that COVID did a, a couple things for me, in addition to exposing and, and, and um, I would, uh, you know, uh, the issues around disparities and issues around uh, social justice, et cetera. But let's not forget that this is actually on repeat mode. In 1918, the flu pandemic of 1918, knocked off roughly uh, 675,000 people. Uh, and really at that point, America was uh, substantially smaller. So it's about hundred million people total. But let's not forget that during that period of 1918 to 1921, that you had some of the worst racial incidences in the country. Lynching, the Tulsa incident where Literally, you lost hundreds of African-American lives, not because anyone did anything, but just they happened to be African-American. Elaine, Arkansas, in which you lost almost 200 lives in a period of 48 hours, just simply for them being Black. So these are not new issues, is my point. As we talk about health disparities, as if we continue to rediscover health disparities, let it be known that this probably was best framed in 1899 
by one of the greatest social scientists of his time, W.E.B. Du Bois, in what was called the Philadelphia Papers. So while I am often moved of this new rediscovery and reconnectedness with health disparities, let's not play as if these things are just there and have been discovered today. And let's not just act as if we're writing and discovering new findings about health. Come on, y'all. Some of that work is actually also been, over the last 50 years has been done about not just identifying and frameworking the issues, and clearly it's more nuanced now. We can talk about the digital divide, we can talk about, but the core principles of disparities have been there and written and documented. And interestingly enough, the core solutions were also by blue, many blue ribbon panels, and particularly through the Watts and the you know, Watts riots and all the rest of the stuff in the 60s and 70s. And in fact, there were things even put in place that were shown to be working that were then subsequently dismantled. This year round disparities isn't one in which we don't know. This is a little bit like a diet, I tell everyone. It's when you know, we all know that being overweight and the consequences of that, we know the benefits of actually losing weight and pretty much I think that's universal. We also know that there's probably 10 to 20,000 diets and we know by the literature that if you what? If you stick and commit to one, almost all of them will have you lose weight. The issue for us and particularly the issue for us in academics is that we've been very good at framing the problem. We've been very good about re-announcing the problem. We've been good at times about potentially coming up with solutions, but when it comes to the implementation and the actual commitment, somehow we can't get our act together and there's a lack of will. So this concept about health disparities, we don't know what it is and it's difficult to come up with solutions. I actually think that we need to stop that crazy talk blow off some of the things in the, uh, in the structures that we had put in place before and ask the real questions about what and how do we implement these things in a sustainable manner. And yeah, I don't even wanna spend a lot of time. We know that even in our own field, there are blind spots and always have been. Many of you know back in, uh, in April 21, March, April 21, the, the hubbub that came because you know one of our colleagues said something uh, um, you know, from JAMA, you know, on, on one of the podcasts about uh, physicians can't be racist and all the talk about structural racism just as making white people and alienating white people. Come on, y'all. When you think back to many of the other earlier studies, Marian, you know, Jane Aaron Sims and the issues of using African-American slaves because he thought that they didn't experience pain and as a result of not experiencing pain would develop the repair fistulas. Uh, again, the father of modern day, you know, gynecology, surgical gynecology, right? Use these things to the benefit of others. Right? As we think about issues within the context of, as people like to call it the Tuskegee, Institute, well, I refer to it as the United States Public Syphilis Study of 1932, where clearly the use of African Americans to understand the natural history of syphilis was not to benefit African Americans, but simply to benefit others. Let's stop playing. And by the way, it is interesting to me, particularly in public health, at the very moment where we are in basic science, basic translational science and a lot of my work even though it's you know certainly has developed uh, around the public sphere still is focused on a lot of RNA binding protein and protein methylation but let us but it's interesting that, that we can have such a wonderful conversation about at the individual cell level cleaning all the information from one epithelial cell one individual cell but we can't do the same for people in fact, it was Mina Bissell and Joan Bruni at some point who pointed out to me, who were wonderful scientists at the time, who pointed out to me that the epithelial cell, because I was an epithelial cell biologist, um, was not just, you know, getting disrupted on its own. There was an information going back and forth between the stroma, which we used to think was inert, but that stroma that surrounded these epithelial cells were having conversations back and forth that influenced the epithelial cell to become a cancer cell. That concept of the genome impacts the cell. 
Well, I submit to you that individuals actually also have a stroma. That stroma is called the community. And there is communication before, between the community and that individual that ultimately allows that individual to grow or not. This is clearly a made-up term. I've just made it up. But the genome impacts the cell as the xenome impacts the individual. I think it's time that we start thinking about place and space and the concept of, as I've talked about, the concept of zip code neighborhood of association, i.e. your ZNA and the impact it has on the DNA and your biological outcomes. When I think of ZNA, I think of examples right here in Chicago, or you could pick Detroit or anywhere else. The life expectancy um, in this area, high area of, um, of wealth is called the loop. That loop uh, is, is where uh, you know, Keanu Reeves or Oprah Winfrey or others would actually go to uh, and hang out. Beautiful facilities, beautiful gyms, beautiful access to the lake and working out and fresh foods, et cetera, et cetera. The life expectancy there was uh, 85. The crazy thing is when you go four and a half miles west, the life expectancy drops to 16. And when you go literally eight and a half miles south of the loop in an area called Inglewood, it drops down, it's reduced by 30 years. Now listen, I know some of you are saying, Dr. Wynn, come on, man. You know, I, you know, listen, it's Chicago, it's, you know, it's like Detroit. It, it, this clearly is related to gun violence and all this other stuff. You would be wrong. Those things are factored in. It turns out that they're negligible in explaining the life expectancy differences. Now, one might actually argue that this is just unique to places like Detroit, or this is unique to places like uh, you know, uh, Chicago or up in, in DC, but you would be wrong. We know that the stressed rural counties uh, throughout the Appalachians and particularly in areas like Kentucky, the Eastern side of Kentucky, you can see in some cases an 18 year life difference between someone living in Lexington versus someone living in Beeville, Kentucky. Place matters. For a very long time, academic cancer centers like mine have focused, rightfully so, on the fundamental research and, and the impact of the downstream factors. But I think that if we've learned nothing else through this pandemic and through the issues that we've been having post George Floyd, it's that we must also pay attention to those upstream determinants of health. Many tag those, the social determinants of health. And I think we've been doing a better job in trying to, through the National Cancer Policy Forum, of bringing attention to the impact of food insecurity, uh, housing, and things like transportation. I think we've been doing a better job of understanding of how we know that, for example, uh, I think the American Cancer Society put out that uh, the having uh, the lack of transportation accounted for more than four to five million people not getting the quality care that they should be getting. But I want to stop the hashtag social determinants of health conversation right now. <laughs> social determinants of health didn't just happen. Social determinants of health were created by policies, economics, and politics of their time. Let's start with Homer Hoyt, graduate from University of Chicago, who came in uh, to be the head of the uh, Federal Housing Act of 1934, which was, you know, you know, FDR's way of getting people back in their homes. I mean, it's been through tough economic times. This plan was to say, you're right, we should get people back in the homes, but we have to do it in an orderly fashion. Omar Hoyt was also a man of his time, and his thesis was essentially what would later be called uh, the concept of redlining. Now, you've probably heard in the New York Times 
People talk about well redlining and the issues of that are still impacting um, you know, minority communities today. But let me just take you through this about why I am trying to get people to get out of this concept that Blacks just tend to be, quote, more predisposed uh, or, or that there's something innately more uh, uh, you know, biologically set up for them to have cancer. Let me stop you right there and say, let me take you through the next couple of slides and tell you why I stopped that conversation several years back. Also let it be known that the act of redlining was set up on the pseudoscience and the best science of the time of eugenics. So what does this slide say? If you look at the slide, the areas that are in the red slash pink and yellow were the areas in which people could not get home loans. These were considered to be the undesirables. The areas pictured in the green, green and the blue are the areas that were considered to be well worth giving folks home loan. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it broke down around race. Turns out that Dr. Hoyt had come up with a way based on eugenics that being, being that whites and blah, 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 and these various groups would give back the money based on a soft science, right? That, you know, whites would certainly give back the money. So that blue and green areas where the concentration of whites were, in this case, 1935, that was considered the west side of um, Richmond and the east side of Richmond, which is a concentration of African-Americans is, is, is to this day, it breaks down even in 2022 that there was an east side predominantly uh, populated by African-Americans and a west side predominantly populated by Caucasians. It sanctioned segregation. But it wasn't the sanctioning of segregation that at the end of the day did in many of these communities. In fact, despite the redlining issues, many African-Americans in Virginia and even in Detroit actually profited, benefit. We had what was called the Black Wall Street here in Jackson Ward, which is now called Gilpin Court. This Jackson Ward was considered to be the home of the South. They had their own banking, their own commerce, their own food. But it was the urban renewal that impacted Michigan, the urban renewal that impacted Virginia, the urban renewal that impacted many of the um, uh, states and cities within our country where we were deliberately building white roads through black bedrooms that ultimately devastated many of these communities. That devastation was then augmented and enhanced by the placement of many industries that ultimately were placed in these non-desirable areas that contributed to more hazardous air. And by the way, if you weren't counting, as a result of, we know that the diesel fume, and I think this is work by uh, Vicki Seawald and many others out in California, they're looking completely at um, the issue of exposure to diesel fume. But I wanna take you back to Dr. Tessum from University of Illinois, um, who has shown before all this conversation has come up that particular matter 2.5, which is associated with cancer, by the way, is disproportionately and systemically affecting people of color in those areas. We know, this is an example of Baltimore, that the issue of the urban heat islands, where uh, we know that the poorest areas are in areas where the heat, right, is substantially higher in some areas, as much as seven to eight degrees, and that that results also in chronic disease. This is a picture of an example of an urban heat island. As I showed you in 1935, the east side of Richmond, which was then called Jackson, what we still have Jackson, what was called Gilpin Court, is pictured on your right, the east end. And the west end, still, there is a, about a five to six point different degrees in temperature, but we're starting to get even more hip to the fact that these urban heat islands are contributing to this. Why do I say this? I want to tell you this because we need to stop this crazy talk that it just so happens that Black are just more, you know, more predisposed to cancer. And they just biologically, this is a crock that needs to be not entirely wrong in the sense that I believe that there are certainly things that we know through science around the contribution, maybe 20% to different genetic issues. But let's not forget that the ZNA 
This zip code neighborhood of association, the genome, actually also plays a role in impacting our DNA and our biological outcomes. That's not frequently accounted for in many of our papers, which can give us false things about how African Americans may be more predisposed. And I wish uh, Dr. Brawley were here to talk about that we probably should go back and look at this issue around triple negative breast cancer. By the way, when we talk about African Americans being more uh, you know, at risk with triple negative breast cancer, and again, the data we need to probably go back and look at that, we don't even talk about ancestry. We talk about Black as if it's a thing as opposed to the social construct it was. Work done by Lisa Newman has pointed out that if you're African American, but have predominantly more Eastern African descent or ancestry, your outcomes with triple negatives are better than if you are a woman and, you know, Black African American with West African ancestry. And the same could be said probably if we were to look even closer than what we call, quote, white. This is a time where we shouldn't be afraid of data. This is a time where we should be able to grapple, obviously, with the um, difficulties and the messiness with the science to get better. And by the way, there makes no sense to me why, as we're talking about data, that we are so afraid of small area analysis. With all the machine learning and with all the AI, with all these other things kind of going on, and I got it, garbage in, garbage out, but you can't convince me that we are at a point right now where we're still going to be comfortable talking about we have negligible populations. This is why they're not measured. Dr. Weiner and I just recently wrote something in Trends in Cancer, really comparing urban and rural and understanding that, to be honest with you, desperate groups really do share a commonality and some cancer disparities. And it's not just a Black-white thing. It's a place and space thing. And as I'm winding up, and I'll be finished in a second, the reality is we too have to worry about this issue of trust. I have to say to you that I am certain that we'll continue the onslaught of in the progress of scientific research and our new cures and our new technologies. But what I'm not certain about is that we will maintain a public trust. Many of you read articles like this where the health system grows wealthier while its neighbors stay sick. You can put any of us there. But the crazy part is even in the face of having a miracle, an mRNA vaccine that we know was probably the best vaccine ever. We were patting ourselves on back as public health officials, as academics, about how we were wonderfully came together and did this. And yet, when it came to a public trust, we understood that some people just simply didn't care. If you look at public trust data from the 70s and 80s and 90s, there's a consistent disconnect and reduction of the connectedness and the trust that our public has for us in our science. We're going to have to do something about that. This is an attempt for me to be able to do that. Redeem Mercer Haynes and uh, Pastor Todd Gray from the historic Fifth Street Baptist Church got together and formed a, 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 a partnership because it turns out that right at the very beginning of COVID, it dawned on me that people weren't listening to doctors and people weren't listening at all to our scientists. But this partnership of a doctor, a lawyer, <laughs> and a pastor did work. In fact, we've been at it every Friday from 3 to 4 Eastern Standard Time, where we are disseminating information with the likes of having both external experts like Dr. Fauci and the First Lady, um, but also we've had really um, bringing information to local folks so that they can actually come back and talk. I'll end up with this that. It turns out that building trust for our community said that, you know, they, there were three things important to them, relevance, accessibility, and flexibility. But the crazy part is all of us in academics say the following, what's not measured is not done. Yeah, well, how come we're not measuring at all or having frameworks for institutional trustworthiness? We continue to talk about building trust, and yet we have no measure metrics when we turn the mirror back on ourselves of our institutional readiness or institutional trustworthiness. Dr. Ruben Tudor and I are starting to put some work on that. And so I actually am a big fan of the responsive research era, right? In cancer centers, we talk about this as a catchment area and what we're responsible to. And I'm convinced that we should continue to put emphasizing discovery science, but you can't convince me that as much as we actually are also focused on discovery science, that we can't 
add delivery science, health sciences um, to that, the implementation sciences to that as a balanced portfolio. This is not an argument of more money going to discovery, less money going in. This is an argument of not an or, but an and. And by the way, we talk about genomics, the pedomics, all the omics, phenomics, but there is a missing omic. It's called the omics of the community or the community omics. That is frequently missing in our discussions that I think we're going to need to use our data. And yes, as messy as it is, I'm more excited about the messiness than I am turned off by it. And we're trying to do big programs in the context of different strategies and different ways of using more precise ways of getting the data to actually have interventions, uh, including our work with SAS um, about creating what we call uh, uh, areas in which we're able to look backwards and figure out over the last 10 years what the areas look like and you know do some calculations, but more importantly, being able to do some predictive analysis forward. I'll end with these next two slides. Ralph Abernathy, um, right on the eve of the Apollo 11 launch was the first time we were going to place a man on the moon. Made such a ruckus. And for those who don't know Ralph Abernathy, he was with Martin Luther King, Reverend Schultz, a big civil rights person. They made such a ruckus that the folks from NASA had to say, could you please just send somebody out there and keep these guys from, from, from doing this? Ralph Abernathy said to uh, Dr. Thomas Paine, who was then the deputy of NASA, listen, I'm not anti you putting a man on the moon. In fact, I'm fascinated by that. We support that. We applaud that. We understand the, 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 the miracle that you're about to do and the value of it to all of us as Americans. But I just have one question. Why can't that same attention being paid to issues around poverty in my communities? And Thomas Paine, without missing the beat, said famously, Reverend Amanathy, because it's easier to put a man on the moon than it is to address these issues. Well, in 2022, it seems to me that it's easier to put our neighbors into space than it is to address those issues. And it's disappointing because in the words of Fred, uh, in words of John, John F. Kennedy, right? We put the man into space, not because it is easy, but what it's said, because it's hard and yet, Every time we talk about small area analysis, every time we talk about addressing these issues around equity in our neighborhoods, we talk about the difficulty of it. Well, I'm tired about talking about the difficulty of it. And I think that this is a call to action for all of us to bring our best to the table, to figure out how we can start making through the power of data and other things, making differences. And so with that, I'll stop. I know I probably overstayed my welcome, but I wanted to say uh, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to come back home and talk to you all. Uh, uh, at Michigan, I uh, I went to med school there. I'm always, you know, and my heart's always with Michigan. So again, thank you for the invite to to coming back to share some of the work that um, we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you so very much. If people want to write any questions in chat, um, please go ahead, and I can read your questions. Uh, or if, if anyone has a question here in person, please just raise your hand. We'll pass the mic. You know, that, that's a lot in the morning. I tried to stay off the coffee just to make sure I wouldn't get too amped up. Or if anyone wants to just unmute yourself and and ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. I I can go. Sure. Hello, Dr. Wynn. Um, I also heard you speak last week at Case Western and wanted to thank you for being so honest and um, I don't know what word to use other than um, outright, frankly, challenging the structural racism that exists in policies that actually not only exist previously, but even today when policies are made policymakers are sort of blind to how racism informs their policymaking. So I was wondering, how do you think, um, you know, people 
like us and and I've noticed that this is a an increasing conversation amongst academic circles about how we have to step out of our academic silos to take this conversation more into the public space. Um, you know, all the research is there. We know how this works, but how do we actually make real change? And um, I'm somebody who's very politically interested. Um, my degree is in law and public policy. Uh, and now I'm working in a very academic research space doing research in on uh, disparities and cancer outcomes. The worlds are just so separate and there's existing, um, uh, I guess, hurdles uh, that are institutional at times to uh, sort of navigate that gap. Like you, you can't, for example, uh, easily invite politicians or policymakers to these kinds of spaces without going through appropriate channels. So I'm wondering, how do you think, and I know that this is a tough question, um, how, how, how do we do this? Like how, you know, we're almost working in a bubble right now. Like all of the people on this call, I imagine we all sort of, to a certain extent, understand how uh, disparities are informed by all the isms and the terrible things that we see in society. So how, how do we step out of this bubble? And how, how do we talk to people who are, you know, we're living in an increasingly polarized world where, you know, the moment we talk about this stuff, we're labeled as woke, which is now an insult. <laughs> so what, what do you think? Like, how, how, how do we do this? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, I'd like to start off with actually understanding the people that as academics, our world has also changed. In the 1950s, you didn't have competing institutions like uh, Google, who are also interested in your data, and Amazon, who are all interested in data. I think that the playing field has been equal essentially, or different or change for us in academics and the old thinking from the 1950s that of our academic purity, that those times have actually slightly shifted just a little bit, particularly with the focus on data. I'm now moving my institution, I've certainly moved my cancer center from my early pursuits of just academic excellence, of which I still think has great benefits to a transition towards academic relevance. It doesn't mean that we don't uh, continue to publish papers or we don't do grants, but it does mean that we have to deal with the reality that our world has changed even as academics from here in 2022 to what it was in 1952. And by the way, I actually now, um, and the SAS data and all the rest of the stuff, one of the first things I've done is to focus no longer on zip codes. Zip codes are data that for me is useful for academics and useful for postmen, but not usable at all to my doggone communities. Mm -hmm. And I'm transitioning from now the focus on trying to understand useful versus usable data and trying to actually put the usable data in that tranche of what I consider to be academic relevant and an academic relevant approaches. What do mm -hmm. I mean? I now actually calculate all my data, cancer data, in terms of voting districts, from the smallest ones to the districts, you know, my councilmen, councilwomen, to larger ones with the state reps, state senators, to ultimately also my, you know, the, the federal people like the House of uh, Abigail Spanberg or Senator Kane. All of that data now is collected in the way people vote. Why? Because ultimately, when I come up with something, I then have to use it to then influence or at least impact knowledge of the people who have the resources and the authority to make change. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I do the voting district type issues or voting districts issues, or uh, what I used to call the ward-based approach or the district-based approach, it turns out that I have much more solid conversation even with our community hospitals because everyone can define a place and space. But when you actually talk about zip codes, all of a sudden it allows for people to say, it's not my part, that's his part. I used to have that in, in Chicago where they would say, oh, this part is this, right? Well, I don't have this part. You don't have this part, right? I started saying, let's put playing around and put it into issues of power or units of power of voting. 
And so that's how we're doing all of our things. So again, that's a great question. I can only tell you that we are going to have to be much more aware that if we're not focused on the academic relevance of things and the pragmatism of what we're doing with our academic issues, we will be made potentially the possibility of made less and less important because other industries are certainly are doing and capable of doing much of what we're doing these days. So again, thank you for the question. Thank you. That's probably a tough answer in the morning though. No, no, it was great. I particularly really liked you talking about smaller than the zip code unit, which is, you know, some research is happening at that level now um, with different kinds of social determinants of health um, and different kinds of metrics to measure that. So it is really interesting to see that you have been using that to um, reach out to, you know, the powers that be to make those uh, cha policy changes. So I appreciate the answer a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Know, you. At some point that here in Massey, we'll be able to work with folks at Michigan. That would be so cool to me. Anyone else have a question? I guess I'll ask one question before we move on. Um, so what would you say is the, um, if you could say one thing that you think, um, you know, data scientists, people who aren't involved in um, community research, not because they don't want to be, but because they don't have the skills to, to do it. You know, their training was like myself, you know, math, statistics. Um, what's the one thing that we can do um, to, to help this situation? Yeah, I, I'd say there's two quick things. One involves courage the courage to understand that these things are messy and that while you want data that is totally validated and while you want data that's completely stable, that we run the risk sometimes of not being in the messies on the fringes and trying to control for that as best as possible. But we run the risk of having communities in Detroit or communities on the south side of Chicago says, what does your data mean to me? I already know we pulled. We've been that way for 30, 40 years. So what's different? The other thing is the courage to actually start thinking out of the box and bringing new voices to the table as you are creating your thoughts. As we think about data scientists, this is an area in which I look that while we have uh, you know, lack of disparities in, in, in lots of ways and diversity, this is an area of where have been our national, local, regional efforts in trying to bring about diverse voices into the pipeline of the data scientists. And the reality is, the third thing is, I've challenged my folks at Illinois and I'll challenge my folks here in, uh, in Virginia that particularly our data scientists and engineers occasionally, what's the pipeline and the exposure you have to the things that you're measuring? Going to the community sometimes actually will change a lot. I had one of my engineers once said, you know, Rob, thank you for taking me. I had to take them on the West and South Side. Thank you for taking me on the West and introduce and, and talking to community members because all of a sudden what I thought was a great idea is not very practical because it will not be used because in addition to what we come up with, behaviors matter. And so the, I would say as my grandmother, the only two things I know is grace and humility and a little bit more courage and a lot more humility from our data scientists and our academics, I think it's really needed for us to propel uh, what we, I believe, have the power to do to, to, to move that forward. Thank you. Yeah, I think we can all encourage our collaborators or try to collaborate with people who are doing things like using voting districts as opposed to zip codes or, or not even thinking about these things at all. Um, so I think, yeah, that's something we can do. So um, any last, any last question? Because I think we're a few minutes behind the schedule, right? Where you got, listen, you know, I know I'm wearing y'all out in the beginning of the morning, so I apologize for that. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. It was absolutely fabulous to have you back here at University of Michigan. Thank you. Thank you.